God, we thank You for shedding Your blood to pay the price for our sins, to fulfill the law, to set us free, to walk in faith and relationship with You. Lord, we thank You that that freedom we know is not a license to live immoral. But God, we thank You today that our sins are forgiven. Not by the deeds of the law, but by faith in Your blood. And Lord, we don't come by, with any righteousness of our own because that's filthy rags. That's what You said. It's Your righteousness. And we thank You for it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. We want to welcome everyone. Fire and Grace Church this morning. I'm Pastor Dean Odell, otherwise known as the thorn in the side of certain individuals, the monkey in the wrench, the fly in the ointment. But I don't mind, because you know what? All my hope is in Jesus. It's not in me. Amen. Nor is it in my ability to keep the law. We're going to talk about that again today. This is going to be part two. We're going to follow on from last week. As I didn't define some of the things that needed to be defined. And of course, I'm just going to say, I know some people are getting ill, but I'm going to explain some things today. I've entitled this today, The Ebionites, Rob Skiba, and the Law. Now, I don't believe it's ever been a time in a Sunday morning sermon that I've actually put the name of an individual in the title of a message, but it was necessary because many of you know last week and the week before I've kind of dealt with some of the heresies and some of the heretics and some of the things that were going on at the Flat Earth International Conference in Denver. And so last week I was kind of dealing with some of the Gnostic heresies that's crept in through people like Zen Garcia, uh, calling the Holy Spirit feminine. And uh, so, you know, the goddess, the Gnostic goddess Sophia, and of course, I did touch on because what I what I touched on last week was the scripture from Second Second uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, where Paul warned that the people would preach another Jesus, they would have another gospel, and they'd have another spirit. And when I got to the part about another gospel, I said this in the message loud and clear. I said, "If where's where's Jordan? If, if right? <laughs> if." You teach keeping the law of Moses, trying to go back and keep the Old Testament laws, ceremonies, rituals, so on and so forth, circumcision, Sabbaths, feasts, new moons, dietary laws, tassels on your clothing and belt or whatever. And you believe that that's what makes you righteous or is a salvation issue or is fruit of your salvation or whatever. I said, if that's what you believe, then you are a heretic. You have perverted the gospel. I didn't add anybody's name to that. But it triggered a certain individual. Triggered them to the point of absolute insanity. And as you will know, that individual is Rob Skiba. Now, for those of you who don't know him, he happens to be a pretty well-known, pretty influential guy in the truth community, alternative, you say Christian. He was known for teaching about the Nephilim and some other things. And then, of course, he got into Flat Earth, and a lot of people came to know him through um, him taking a stand, as I did as well, for biblical cosmology. And on a lot of those things, he does very good work and stays true to the Scriptures. But as I began to learn, as I didn't know him before Flat Earth, um, as I began to learn, he's also into the Torah movement, or being Torah observant. Now, at first, that's not shocking to me, because as I've said, I've had friends in the past who went to Messianic Jewish congregations and, you know, went to church or their services on Friday evening and, and had, you know, celebrated the feast to the best of their ability. But never, ever was it a requirement for you to be righteous, or, or at least if you didn't do it, you weren't called the the janitors and sewer workers of the kingdom of God. Okay? 
That's a direct quote from Mr. Skiba, right? Um, so I feel it's important because the community needs to know who teaches what, who believes what. And some of these guys like Zen and Rob are not always fully upfront and honest in the sense of what they believe or they say out of both sides of their mouth and it takes a while to figure out which, what's the real core belief. And, you know, I've been keeping a file on Skiba for about two years of just screenshots and trying to figure out and actually contacting him and having conversations, private conversations, uh, trying to find out, does he really believe that New Testament, New Covenant believers have to go back and try to keep the ceremonial law of the Old Testament and the Sabbaths and the new moon, right? And the, and, the, and the tassels on your belt and all this. Do you have to do that to really be right with God? To really be as holy and pure as clean? And what I've discovered is he says out of one side of his mouth that it's not a salvation issue. And the next minute he says, if you don't do those things in the Old Covenant, then I question your salvation. And I'm going to show you that he says it. Now, a lot of people out there are getting bent out of shape because they think, well, oh, I'm sick and tired of seeing you two pastors squabbling on Facebook and on social media. First of all, Rob Skeep is not a pastor, and that's by his own admission. He even says he's not a teacher, and he says he tells people don't look to him, but then the way he teaches and the way he speaks, it is, look at me, I'm right. And everybody else in church history since the beginning, except for the apostle, and even maybe the apostle Paul, everybody else is wrong, but I, we, we Torah people got it right, and I got it right. To the point he called me and Nathan Roberts, he called us um, lawless Nicolaitan Christians with the spirit of Antichrist um, lead, basically leading people astray. I'm going to show you. I'll show you all that this morning. And, and, and that we're at war with God, with Yahweh. That's what he said. Now, this is the level of insanity. But see, what I said to him, and we, I did answer one of his posts, because he came unglued after my sermon last week. He said, you called me a heretic. He's watching this morning, too, I assure you. He called me a heretic. I never said Rob Skeet was a heretic. I said, if. You teach that we must keep the law of Moses, and I'm talking about primarily the rituals and the ceremonial things. There's the, the moral law was carried over into the New Testament about adultery and murder and lying. We'll deal with that this morning too. But I said, if you, if you teach that as salvational, as for righteousness, then you're a heretic. Well, if he didn't teach that for salvation and righteousness, then he shouldn't have been bothered by anything I preached. And it was interesting on the thread, I kept making that point on his page that he deleted that whole thread. Because he shouldn't have been triggered. You know why, why what I said last week triggered him? Because he, that's his heart belief. He does believe that you have to keep the law of Moses to be right with God. And I'm going to prove it today. All right? But this is not a new problem. I said this last week. This is not a new, the Torah, and I'm going to call it the extreme Torah movement. Because again, I know some people that, that want to do those things just to learn and enhance their knowledge. And that's all fine. But the moment they start condemning others that don't and making others, telling others they're going to be janitors and sewer workers in the kingdom of God if they make it at all because he questions their salvation. then we have a perverted gospel. And Paul, the very thing Paul warned about in Galatians, that the person that perverts the gospel like that is accursed. Oh yeah, and I ain't afraid to say it. Because the whole book of Galatians was about people coming in and saying, you got to be circumcised, you got to keep the feast, you got to keep the law of Moses to be really right with God, to find your righteousness, your justification, and Paul said, anyone who does that is perverting the gospel. And that man is a curse. They're preaching a different gospel. And like I said, if you weren't, Rob, you wouldn't have got triggered last week. But you are exposed, sir. 
And I don't care who it is. See, I, I, I don't kiss Christian celebrity butt. So let's keep going. Now some people have been bit out of shape because, oh, you shouldn't name names. You shouldn't do things publicly. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, reread your Bible, please. Because 1 Timothy 4, 10 through 15 here, Paul named some names of some people. He didn't just name names on Facebook. He named it in the Word of God that would last forever. All right? <laughs> he says here, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus when thou come. Bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. And look what he says here. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him for his works, of whom beware of him. For he hath greatly withstood or opposed our words. Okay? Paul name of names. Alexander the coppersmith. He even told what he did for a living. All right? Let's look at one more here. And yeah, 3 John, the epistle. So not just Paul, because I know they hate Paul. So I'll bring in the Apostle John here too. Right? The Apostle John, 3 John, his epistle, 9 through 12. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. Remember that, prating against us with malicious words. What do you think calling me Antichrist, Spirit Lawless, Nicolaitan? That's malicious words, isn't it? So I'm calling out Diotrephes, Skiba. All right? Oh, his blood's going to be boiling. I know. Just take it easy, buddy. I still love you. I hope the truth will set you free from your error. Okay? He says here, Wherefore, if I come, I remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and cast them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. And then he talks about Demetrius. Names another guy. He said he has a good report of all men and of the truth itself. And we also bear record and you know that our record is true. So I just wanted you to see the apostles. I mean, Paul talked about Hymenaeus, Philetus, Hermogenes, some of these other guys that were teaching error. And we could bring those passages up, but I'm going to move on. Now, I call this the Ebionites this morning because I mentioned them last week, but I did not read this. I did not give you the definition. I just told everybody to look it up themselves. But this is from the Ancient Church Fathers, a great book. Anybody wants a basic, good kind of overview of church history uh, from the time of the apostles on. Uh, this is a good book, Ancient Church Fathers, What the Disciples of the Apostles Taught Ken, by Dr. Ken Johnson. Um, in his book there, he talks about the Ebionites and, uh, and the Gnostics and so on and so forth. But here's what he says. There was a sect called the Ebionites that broke away from the apostles after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, which clearly stated that Gentile believers were not required to keep the law of Moses or the Sabbath. This group believed Jesus was the Messiah. So they still said Jesus was the Messiah, right? They still believe this group believed Jesus was the Messiah, but taught that observance of the ceremonial law was necessary for salvation and that no one could be saved by faith in Christ alone. They practiced circumcision and observed the law of Moses and the Judaic style of life. They tried to act like they were Jews and live like Jews and still be Christians. Uh, some of them refused to acknowledge that Jesus was the pre-existing being, uh, uh, was pre-existing being God, the Word. So you see this in the Torah movement. There's a lot of them leaning this direction. And I'll prove to you that today that really even the Skebites don't believe that Jesus is fully God. I'll show you that in a second. All right. They say it's getting crazy. But anyway, the, these uh, Ebionites 
It says that they, some of them, not all, but some of them refused to acknowledge that Jesus was pre-existing, being God the Word. They observed strictly the bodily worship of the law of Moses and reproached Christians for eating unclean meat. So they push the dietary laws, right? And condemned anybody that didn't do it like they did. They stated Isaiah's prophecy of a virgin conceiving should be translated young woman. And as I've dealt with this in our ministry school class, no, the word is virgin and it's used virgin in other places, the Hebrew word, the original Hebrew word. So this is another twisting thing they do because, because they want to, listen, this stuff always is, when you start trying to go back under the law, it starts to diminish Jesus, who he is and what he's done whether directly or subtly. Uh, they go and say, they stated Isaiah's prophecy of young virgin conceiving should be translated young woman instead, and they rejected all the epistles of the apostle Paul, whom they called an apostate from the law. Now, some of these go ahead and say that they reject the epistles of Paul as New Testament scripture, as Holy Spirit inspired scripture, and some of them just condemn it all the time. Skiba falls in the camp of just condemning it and mocking it and ridiculing it and trying to compare it as different all the time than, than at, at odds that Paul at odds with Jesus. But we'll see how that works. Eusebius, the father of known as the father of church history, says that the Ebionite doctrines were spawned by evil demons. Uh, those I love those early church fathers. They spoke plainly, kind of like I do. All right because you don't have time to play around with this stuff. So that's the Ebionites. Does that sound like the Torah movement? Identical. This began after the apostles met. Now remember, let's remember this. The apostles met, the council in Acts 15, the apostles met, all the apostles and the elders met to answer the question. Are Gentiles and New Covenant believers required? Is it required to keep the Sabbath, the law of Moses, and circumcision? Now, when I brought this up to Rob Skiba on the phone, that we both have the telephone conversation we both have recorded. When I brought this up, he said, oh no, they just said the circumcision. It's just, they were just talking about circumcision. I said, no, 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 Rob, I've read it. It says circumcision and keep the law of Moses. And the apostles said, we gave no such commandment to the Gentiles. No such commandment. No, it was these Torah people back then that were pushing that on new believers in Jesus Christ. They just can't accept the freedom and the liberty we have from the law. They can't. They can't stand it. They want to bring us into their bondage. Now let's, let's read. I mentioned this a minute ago, but I want you to see it so you know it's not Pastor Dean saying this. People say, I, I, just before we came, a brother commented on my Facebook page and said, this is just a secondary issue. Why don't you move on? No, it's not a secondary issue. This is defining what the gospel is and what is required for salvation. This is pretty foundational to our faith here, right? And what is the law? And what is the moral standard we are to live by? Because, of course, Skiba always uses the straw man argument that we're lawless. We basically say, because of grace, you can live however you want. That's not us at all. It's never been me. I wrote a book called Grace Abuse against that. So, so that accusation is nothing but a straw man argument. A straw man argument, you'll see in a minute, misrepresenting your opponent's position because you can't really fight his arguments. And Skiba's the king of the straw man, as you'll see. But this is Galatians 1, verses 6, and this is what he says. I marvel, he's saying to the Galatian Christians, that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, not the law, of Moses, but into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
as you're going to see in a minute, one of Skiba's mentors and teachers had an angel appear to him. And he teaches this stuff. So that's where it came from. He says, as we say before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if yet I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So, okay, that's chapter one. What's he talking about? Well, in chapter two, he rebukes Peter for getting carried away with the, under the pressure of the Torah observers and separating from the Gentiles and not eating with them. And, and Paul rebukes him. And one of the things, if you read there in chapter 2, when Paul rebukes Peter, he says, Peter, you don't even live. You're a Jew, and you li don't even live as a Jew. You live as a Gentile. Why are you compelling the Jews to live? I mean, the Gentiles to live as Jews. So Paul declared that Peter said, he told him, you don't even live like a Jew. What, what, is, what is this? What is this falling under the pressure? And let me tell you, these Torah people can put some pressure on folks. And if you don't yield, then they get nasty. Huh? I could, whoo, I could share some stuff on that. So what, what, what is Paul talking about then? So he has to rebuke Peter over giving into just a little, just slipping into a little bit of Torah observance. And then he says this right here. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. The word justified means to be as one ought to be. To be holy, to be righteous, to be right with God, to be as God wants you to be. Look it up. Right? So he says that no one, no man is justified by the works of the law. But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified as one ought to be. Righteous, holy, sanctified, clean. No. You don't make yourself any cleaner by putting tassels on your belt. Tassel boy. With your little tassel parties. No. No. That doesn't make you more clean, more righteous. Or more holy, whether or what day you meet on, or what day you choose to rest, or what you choose to eat. Because the, the New Testament is clear, we are not under those things. Every creature can be received. We're not under dietary laws anymore. We pray over it, and the Bible says it's it's sanctified, purified, made holy by the word of God in prayer. First Timothy 4. So anybody that comes along and says, well, you can't eat shellfish and you can't eat pork and you can't eat this and you can't eat that. And they're sucking down GMO stuff as, they, as we speak. And they got to sit there and try to read labels and find out if pork's in something. I'm sorry, but I just, I don't believe I need the works of the law. I just pray over it in Jesus' name and faith. Look at this right here, though. He, say, he goes on to say, look at this right here. He says, look at, let's skip to verse 19 real quick. For He says, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Well, if I'm dead to the law, if Paul said I'm dead to the law, then why would I dare go back and try to keep it? How does a dead man go back and keep the law? He said, I'm dead to it. I'm dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Meaning because I'm crucified with Christ and I'm in Christ, he fulfilled the law. He, that's the only way I fulfill the law is be in Him. All right? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness, right standing, as one ought to be, come by the law in any measure, then Christ is dead in vain. That's why this is so serious. The moment you start saying, no, it's what Jesus did, it's not quite good enough to make you clean, just your faith in Him and your relationship with Him. No, you got to go back and try to keep the law of Moses that no man could keep except Him. Heck, in the, like I've said before, in the Garden of Eden, there was one commandment and mankind didn't keep it. We are not really good at keeping commandments, right? Hence the reason 
God had to come in the flesh, born of a virgin, live a sinless life, die for our sins, pay the penalty of our sin on the cross, and then rose from the dead because death could not hold him. And that all I have to do is believe in him and start following him in a relationship where I hear his voice according to the new covenant, not the old. This should be basic. This is basic Christianity 101. I learned this when I was 19 years old. Fundamentals. Foundational. You know how I got it? I wasn't going to church. I was just reading the New Testament. That's how I got it. You actually have to have a Torah teacher to confuse you. Basically, they're the only ones that can understand Galatians, I guess. Because everybody else gets it wrong about Galatians. We can't just read this and believe it. We've got to have them to reinterpret it for us because they really know what Paul meant. Paul really meant, no, you've got to keep the law. How they get that out of Galatians, I'll never understand. But they act like we're ignoramuses. You know? I've been studying this for going on now 32 years. I mean, I'm into almost... You know, I, I'm, I'm good into my 32nd year of studying the Bible diligently. Church history, Hebrew, Greek. No, we're not stupid. You're not the only one that's got it figured out. Now, now let me say this. Let me add, you know, Chris Putnam. Anybody heard, remember Chris Putnam? Chris Putnam. Passed away two, three years ago now. He's a theologian, researcher, uh, author of a lot of books with Tom Horn, um, Exo Vaticana, Petros Romanus. He wrote, uh, I think one of his last books was uh, Supernatural Worldview. Few, you know, there's a few theologians in the world. There's a few the that are actually spirit filled and love Jesus. And he was one of them. And actually, I'm not the first one to finally come out and Name Skiba by name and rebuke him for his errors. Chris Putnam did it a few years ago before he died. And this is an article by Chris Putnam called The Gross Errors of Russ, Pappy Hook, and Rob Skiba. And I, I bring this out here. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. You, can, you guys can look this stuff up yourself. But he says here, unfortunately, Rob Skiba's fallen under the false teaching of the cultic pseudo-scholar named Russ, Pappy Hook. Huck has a book, writ, uh, written a book entitled Epidemic, examining the infected roots of Judaism and Christianity. That appears to be the source of Rob's theological errors. Rob has promoted Hook on his radio show and says that Hook changed his life. Now, when you start finding out what this joker believed, remember Rob just said this guy was on his radio show and this guy changed his life, right? Well, let's see what this guy believes, a little bit of it anyway. First of all, Hook denies the Trinity explicitly and thoroughly. Now, one of the most convoluted talk about the Trinity that I've ever heard, Skiba believes, and along with, he got this from Hook, I guess, but he believes that the Trinity, the idea that God has three very distinct aspects, parts, some call it persons, really none of that is incorrect, all right? Regardless of how you want to believe it, God has three parts. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These things are in the Scriptures. Okay? Now, they are one, and I believe can be separate, separated out. But whenever you have, let's say the Holy Spirit's here. The Holy Spirit is here, separated out. He's fully God. Eyes, ears, mouth, nose. He's talking. He speaks. He guides. He's not just the breath of God. That's what Skiba says. Jesus, the Bible says, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians, right? The Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Well, how do you do that unless you're three in one? Right? The Word, by Him all things were made. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus can also be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. So, when Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I'm not saying that there's not three parts. But just like me, and this is how I've explained it for years, 
We're made in the image of God, right? First Thessalonians 5, 23 says we have a spirit and a soul and a body. Every human being has three very distinct parts. But whether it's my spirit over here, it's still the spirit of Dean. If, whether it's my soul right here, it's the soul of Dean. And whether it's my body right here with all three together, it's Dean. It's the fullness of Dean bodily. All right? Now, God showed us with Ezekiel. He showed us with Paul. He could take a man's spirit out of his body. He took Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel said he was in, he was in Babylon. And the Lord takes him by his spirit out of his body and takes him to Jerusalem, to the temple, and shows him what's going on. Guess what? Ezekiel, spirit, uh, soul and body, was in Babylon. His spirit was in Jerusalem. Paul talked to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5. He said, Paul wasn't in Corinth. But he says, you know what? When you're gathered together and my spirit is there with you, we'll judge this individual who's in sin. The witches call it astral projection. God can do it. We don't do it. God does it in us when he wants to do it. Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven. He said, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knew it. <laughs> Meaning, he, he, even out of the body, he was like, it's still fully me if it's just my spirit. It's still fully me. I couldn't even tell whether I'm in the body or out of the body because it's me. So in the sense of there's three different people or persons, no, no. There's three different, very distinct aspects of God, and He chooses to manifest, uh, you know, I mean, He as the Father here, the Son here, the Holy Spirit here, but, but you know, it's not modalism. modalism. Modalism says God can only manifest in one, in one form at one time. And God has three distinct parts that can be all at the same time. But Rob says this about Jesus. He's the literal, he said he's the right hand of God. Whoa, 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 he, wait a minute. How, how? You could cut my right hand off and I could live without my right hand. Doesn't sound very important. But how do you reconcile that with Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Oh, wait a minute, that's right, that's Paul's writing. Oh, let's go back to then Isaiah, maybe accept Isaiah. The Son will be given. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Right? So, I'll just say this. Skiba's views of the Trinity is screwed up because this is what he believes. Him and Mr. Pappy believe that Constantine got in and added that to the Bible, that Constantine changed the Bible. This is what they believe. Constantine did not change the Bible. We have 300 years of New Testament stuff going on before Constantine ever even comes on the scene. All right? But let's keep going. Let's look at this. See, this is what bothers me the most. Chris Putnam here documents, Huck denies the Trinity explicitly and, uh, and thoroughly on page 382, he argues that Jesus was never co-equal with the Father, Yahweh, and is not part of the Trinity Godhead. Now, how does this man change your life? This man is a heretic. He goes on to say, says Rob Skiba's main argument against the person of the Holy Spirit also comes from this book. Huck writes, I realize that if there are three persons as taught in Trinitarianism, then Yeshua is not the Son of the Father, but the Son of the Holy Spirit. I've heard Skiba say exactly that on multiple posts in time. All right? So he's, he's parroting Pappy. All right? Huck writes, I discovered that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost in Matthew 28, 19 was not in any of the early manuscripts. Huck falsely claims that Constantine added the Trinitarian formula to the Matthew 28. This is simply not true because all extant manuscripts, you hear that? All manuscripts of the book of Matthew contains the last phrase, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, this kind of makes me wonder because this is a post here or a comment on a thread where 
Rob Skiba says, so the so-called new covenant. Why would any man say that? Because he believes what Pappy teaches, that the New Testament, must, most of it's been corrupted or was corrupted by Constantine. But he didn't tell that to his Skibite followers and groupies. I thank God that Chris Putnam did a little research and took a stand, right? Um, it gets more weird, of course, but let's, let's show this. I love what Chris Putnam does here because Chris Putnam being a true scholar and a true theologian with some real credentials stays true to the scripture in church history. He talks about Ignatius, which I have talked about in our church history class. Ignatius lived in the first century the time of the apostles, uh, he was actually discipled by Paul and Peter. The second chapter of his epistle to the, the Philippians reads, He sent forth the apostles to make disciples of all nations, commanded them to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. This right here, almost 300 years before Constantine. Tertullian in 200 AD, a century before Constantine, writes in on baptism, sealed in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thus, Huck's claims are patently false. It leads one to seriously question his claimed academic credentials. A real scholar would not make such obvious blunders. And then he goes on to say, unfortunately, it gets worse because Pappy started sacrificing lambs on Passover. But we're going to move on from that. Hang on. Now, these are the kind of posts that you get from him. My file is replete with these. Here's one. It says, those who claim the law is a curse or a burden we cannot bear or a yoke around our necks quite clearly have never read Deuteronomy nor Psalm 19 nor most of the prophets nor 1 John 2, 5. So whoever says that the law is a curse, a burden we can't bear, or a yoke, they never read these, right? Well, let me tell you who said those things. The apostles. For those who mock the New Testament pastors like me for quoting exactly what the Bible says about the law being a yoke, burden that could not be kept, bondage, let's see, let's set the record straight about the apostles. Said about requiring New Testament disciples to keep the law of Moses or Torah. The Acts 15 Council of the Apostles and Elders of the early church came together to address this question. Are New Testament Christians required to keep the law of Moses? Here's what he says, Acts 15. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, the new converts, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together to consider this manner. Right? So what happened? It was the apostle Peter who said that requiring the Gentile believers to keep the law of Moses was to, quote, put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now, does, does Rob Skiba believe that, or does he think that's a part Constantine changed? Because now we're talking about Luke. He says, He put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. He even warned them that they would be tempting God if they did so. This is Acts 15, 10 through 11. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which... Neither our fathers nor we are able to bear, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Without the law of Moses, without circumcision, without the Sabbath, that's Peter preaching and Luke recording it. Peter sounds exactly like Paul does in Galatians that they hate. Do you see what we have to start throwing out? But it was also the apostles that said, that if you do this, it was the Apostle James who said that it would be troubling the Gentile believers to compel or require them to keep the law of Moses. Which my sentence is, this is quote Acts 15, 19, Wherefore my sentence, the Apostle James, is that we trouble not them which are among the Gentiles are turned to God. This is plain English. This is plainly written and spoken. The question has been asked and the question has been dealt with by the apostles. But remember, what did we read in the beginning of all this? 
There was a group who said, we don't accept the counsel of the apostles and the elders. The Ebionites. We don't like that. We're going to keep trying to keep the law. We're going to add that to the gospel. No, you don't get to add to or take from. I'm sorry. We have an old covenant and it came to an end. And Jesus said there was a new covenant in His blood. And if the, if, if the old wasn't to pass away, what purpose was there for the new? And the moment you say, I got to go keep the old too, you're saying the new's not good enough. What Jesus did on the cross is not good enough. Walking with Him in relationship and faith is not good enough. That's what you're saying. The blood is not good enough. No, it's good enough for me. I don't know about y'all. Y'all want to keep doing it. Keep going. It says, they put this in a letter to all the Gentile churches from all of the apostles, not just Paul, that those that were saying the Gentiles had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses had troubled them and subverted their soul. So anybody saying this, anybody teaching this is troubling and perverting people's souls. Oh, this is not important. Acts 15, 24, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying that you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Is it just me? Or is everybody in the twilight zone? It was the Apostle Paul who called going back to keep the law of Moses being entangled again with the yoke of bondage and being fallen from grace. Sounds exactly like what they said at the council. How about Jesus himself? The law and the prophets were until John. Until John. Now, the gospel is preached. Amen. He, our brother, so for those that you couldn't say, he says the law, Jesus said the law was until John and now the gospel is preached. The law has an end. I'm going to show you. We're going to get to that. Now here's the passage from Colossians. He says this, Paul, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, speaking of Jesus, quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Now, when he says, let no man judge you in meat and drink, right? That what they'll say is, yeah, you should keep them so no man can judge you. That's the way they twist it around. All right. But what he's saying here is let no man judge you means determine you to be right or wrong, righteous or unrighteous. That's what that word judge means. And then he says this, those things, what? The meat, dietary laws, the drink offerings, the holy days, the feast, the new moon, the Sabbath, all of that was just a shadow. But Christ is the substance. Let me ask you this, and I've said this before. Are you a shadow hugger, a shadow chaser? Or do you want the real thing? Let me tell you something. When I want to hug my wife, I don't try to find her shadow and hug up on it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I want the real thing. Right? How ridiculous. Why would we run back to the shadows when we have the, the middle wall of partition broken down. The veil removed. That we can live and dwell in the Lord of the Sabbath, our rest, our Passover. They all start talking about, oh, well, he's got to fulfill the other feast like he did. No, no. Well, you want me to break it down for you? How Jesus is, hey, Jesus has already fulfilled all the feasts. The seven feasts, right? Unleavened bread, first fruits, Passover, right? All that, that was at his death, his burial, his resurrection, right? All right, 
We know what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? 50 days later, He sent His Holy Spirit, baptized them in the Holy Spirit. That was the day of Pentecost. So He fulfilled that. The Feast of Trumpets. Let me tell you what trumpets means. Trumpets means the message, giving a clear message. What's the clear message now? The Gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the one who lifted up His voice. As, as it says in Isaiah 58, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people. Jesus was the message. He was the trumpet. He's the one in Revelation 1 who when He speaks has the voice of many waters that sounds like trumpets. It doesn't have to be to when He's second coming. And they say, okay, then you got trumpets. Then you have, what's the other one? Uh, Rosh Hashanah. Well, that was Rosh Hashanah. So, the, so then you got, oh yeah, then you got atonement. Oh my goodness. Right? The high priest on the day of atonement going in to atone for the sins of men of Israel. Well, didn't Jesus do that? When he's told Mary, don't touch me, I haven't ascended to my father yet. Jesus went to the tabernacle in heaven, to the mercy seat in heaven, and applied his blood there. And he is our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, no more high priest after the order of Aaron. That ended, that jot and tittle of the law ended, didn't it? There's a little tiny jot and tittle called the, the Levitical priesthood and the high priest. All right. So that's clearly what, what he's talking about here. Can these verses be any more clear? Galatians, no longer in the schoolmaster. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So if the schoolmaster is the law, God used the law to reveal our sin to us and our need for a Savior then once we come to the Savior by faith, we no longer are under the law. That's what this says. But the Torah heads and the Skebites say, no, you still got to keep the law. You still got to be under the law. This is blatant, obvious, clear error. It's deception. It's rebellion to the new covenant. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> Just give me an Episcopalian nod or something over there, right? <laughs> Presbyterian twitch. <laughs> Show a sign of life. The allegory of the two covenants. I mean, this one couldn't be more clear. He says here, tell me you that desire to be under the law. You, want, you guys want to keep the law of Moses? You want to keep the Sabbaths and the new moons and the dietary? All you, to you that desire to do this. So who's he talking to? Torah heads. Tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who is, was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman of the, by the promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, so, so the Sinai covenant, the law. And then he says, for Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Right? And then he says this, for it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath more children than she that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of the promise, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, and boy, do the Torah people persecute the ones who don't want to keep the Torah, who are free, believe they're free from that, according to the New Covenant. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. What does the bondwoman and her son represent in this? The covenant of Sinai. Cast her out. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman of the law, the Sinai covenant, but we are children of the new covenant. I mean, strong word, cast out the bondwoman. But see, let me tell you, this is why they eventually have to go to the place where they say Paul was a false apostle and a heretic because he was against the law. No, he just had a revelation of the truth about that the law was fulfilled, not destroyed, fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled it and then instituted a new covenant. Now, let's go to Galatians 5. 
Everything in this is about this issue. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Okay, what's he talking about? The old I, Paul, say to you, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now think about this. There were people saying, oh, no, no, no. You, we know you believe Jesus is, your, is the Messiah and your Savior, but you still need to be circumcised so you really can be right with God. You can really get close to God so you can really be righteous. And Paul said, if you do that, Christ profits you nothing. Not my words, his. This is why they got to throw Paul out the window. Or tell everybody, you don't understand Galatians. <laughs> For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified, made right, or as one ought to be, or righteous. By the law you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. Meaning he said, trying to keep the law doesn't do anything for you. But faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Rob Skiba. Pappy Hook. Jim Staley, who's still in prison, by the way. We'll deal with him in a minute. This persuasion comes not from him that calleth you. I mean, it's a sad thing when one of your mentors is in prison and somebody just says, hey, did he see out of prison yet? Hey, that's a low blow. <laughs> just ask if he's out of prison yet. He got seven years. He got... <laughs> oh, Sal. He's still under the law. <laughs> Spoken by one who was set free. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Um, yeah. Uh, he's, uh, he's Actually, this guy, Jim Staley, we're talking about, but he's in prison for breaking uh, you know, some of the ten, the big ten. Um, but we'll deal with that in a minute. <laughs> like stealing. Uh, anyway, $3.3 million, but we'll deal with that second. Yeah, isn't that interesting? He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever she, he be. Oh, it's coming. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased? Now listen to this. If I went along with the Torah heads, we could all just sing kumbaya and have effy unity and no strife and division and the snowflakes on Facebook and be happy that pastors and teachers and leaders of the movement aren't fighting. <laughs> how, dare, how dare you say something about him? You know why? Because this is how false teachings continue in the church because no one stands up and just says plainly, here's what they're doing and here's who do, who's doing it. Very little anyway. He goes on to say, Look at verse 13. We'll go there. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So you've been called to liberty from what? From the law. But don't use liberty to indulge the flesh. And then Paul goes on to say, now remember, the straw man, king of the straw man. Mr. Skiba, king of the straw man, always says, you guys are lawless. You're lawless because you don't keep the law. He says here, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then Paul doesn't give a license to live any way you want to live. Let's look at this. Paul says very clearly here, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Oh, and the Sabbath keeping. No, nope, I'm sorry, that's not there. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying, you can't be 
A habitual, the, the word do is prasso in the Greek, means to practice habitual. You can't be an adulterer, a fornicator, unclean, in, in, in the sense of sexual immorality, unclean, it's immoral. Witchcraft, hatred. I mean, he covers those things. This is what I'm saying. Aspects of the old covenant moral law have been carried over. It's just the, it's the basic, we shouldn't live after the flesh. So the moment he tries to twist 1 John chapter 2 about if you don't keep the commandments, you don't know God and the truth is not in you. What commandments am I supposed to keep? Well, to be in context, I got to go back and see what the New Testament says I'm supposed to keep under the new covenant. I've used this example many times. I'm going to use it again. I used it last night in the two and a half hour discussion. Two contracts, right? I had a contract with a modeling agency when I was 18 years old. And the contract said their part of the contract was to get me work and to represent me to, the, to these different companies. And if I had a legal issue with them, they were to represent me. But my part of it was they got 15% of what I earned. And I signed that contract. Now, let's say they came along and they said, hey, I tell you what, Dean, we want to give you a better contract. We're going to, we're going to do everything that we said we're going to do, but we're going to make you a new contract and you're going to only have to give 5% of what you are. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure I read the contract. Because this sounds like somebody pulling a fast one, right? But I read the contract and it's like, wow, this is a better contract. And then I sign, and once I sign, I believe and agree and sign that contract, that's the contract I'm working under. Why would I go back and go, hey guys, let's do this contract and the old one too, right? I guess if you add them together, now I'm back, I'm given 20%, right? No, I'm going to live under the new. I'm going to go back and see, okay, what's required of me under the new? And I'm going to live under the new because it's a better covenant, a better contract with better promises, which happens to be exactly what Hebrews says. That the New Testament, the new covenant, is a better covenant with better promises. Parts of the new, yeah, there's parts of the old still the new. You can't be an adulterer. You can't be a liar, a thief, like Jim Staley. God doesn't want you to live in a habitual immorality. No, no. Nobody that teaches the New Testament correctly is teaching lawlessness. Do what you want. Nobody's teaching that. But yet I get called lawless and the spirit, have the spirit of Antichrist and my salvation's in question because I don't rest on the day that Mr. Skiba thinks I should rest I eat bacon and I don't hang little tassels from my belt. And that's what he's willing to maliciously make these accusations. Call me a Nicolaitan. You know what a Nicolaitan was? He thinks he knows, but he doesn't. His church history, the, the church history guys, the early church fathers said these were guys who were in adultery and they were eating, you know, they were into idolatry and eating things sacrificed to idols and said it didn't matter. So that's, that's one of the accusations that he sent my way, a Nicolaitan. That's pretty malicious, all because I don't believe I have to keep the Old Testament thief, Sabbath, dietary laws, and have little tassels on my coat. Little tassels, you just got to shake it. <laughs> That one gets me right there. And I know right now that I'm just, uh, his blood is boiling. But honestly, I love him. I love Torah people. I wish this was not an issue in the body of Christ dividing us. You wouldn't believe the emails I get from families who say, my, my child went into this Torah thing and all they do is fight with me strife, division. We're talking about Christian families being divided. And let me just go on and say, the division people, people are saying, I'm the one causing division. 
Division does not come from the one who stands up to correct the error. It comes from the ones who sow the error. Amen. Amen. Let's just get that straight. If we can. Let's keep going. Yeah, here's another one. Christians today. Mr. Sk everybody's ignorant but him. Christians today ignorantly use Paul. Ignorantly use Paul. Nobody can use Paul right, right? To say that the perfect life-giving instructions of Yahweh, a.k.a. the Torah or commonly the law, is a curse. Really? You actually believe that the loving instructions given by Yahweh to his people is a curse? That's the, the gross misunderstanding you are going to hang your doctrine on that Paul allegedly taught that Yahweh gave us curses to obey. Let's go to Galatians 3. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So then they which shall be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Faith. Right? A faith walk. For as many... <laughs> For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, is there any way to misunderstand this? If you are of the works of the law, it's what you're about. You're under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 613, of course, Sceva starts whittling those down. So again, it's, I like what, what Shade Stone said last night. It's Torah, do what you can observance. Not Torah observance, but do what you can. Right? So again, they pick and choose. But anyway, he says that if you're under, if you're of the works of the law, you're under the curse because cursed is everyone who doesn't do every single bit of it. And then he says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. This is what he said. No one's justified. It is evident. The just shall live by faith. That's from Habakkuk. The law is not of faith. Everybody say this with me. The law is not of faith. If you're in the law, trying to keep the law, you're not walking in faith. He says the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Listen, what is the curse of the law? The curse of the law is not that God's law was bad. The curse of the law is that we can't keep it. It's so perfect, we can't do it. No one ever did except Jesus. <laughs> and for some reason, this troubles them. And they got to feel better about it by going and putting the tassels. That makes them feel better. I don't want to think about the tassels. I want to think about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I shouldn't even read this here. What law should we keep? Tell us, Rob. What law should we keep? Well, most won't even acknowledge all ten of the ten commandments. The fourth, which, you know, okay, woo, we got to get back to that. So let's start there. Once we realize that all 10 are profitable and good for us, we can discuss the alleged 613, which is supposedly the total number of do's and don'ts in the Torah. Most of those are only for the Levitical priesthood, which are no longer around, as the temple has been gone since 70 AD. I thought not one job and will pass away till heaven and earth. Okay. So a massively huge chunk of the 613 can't, can't be done by them. Well, that sounds kind of like what I'm preaching. Can't be done, right? Nor should they ever be any of us who are not of the tribe of Levi. Then we have a bunch of applicable to kings of Israel. Uh, nope, moving on. Except Jesus said we were kings and priests. I think I remember him saying we were kings and priests, but I digress. Um, but he says not applicable to us. Others only for women. So, you know, you guys got your own set you got to worry about. Uh, so men are out on those. What's left? Basically the Ten Commandments. So this is what he's saying we should do. The Ten Commandments. The Feast of Yahweh, the Seven Feasts, the Dietary Laws, and the wearing of the tzitzits, the tassels. <laughs> Along with the general common sense stuff, like put up guardrails if you have a flat roof so your friends don't fall off and don't have sex with animals, basically. 
That we should all have, you know, we should all be left to do on our own good. In short, what's so hard about this? Seriously, why would people fight against it? I really don't get it. And then he goes on to say, apart from the fact you're just lawless, heathens, if you don't do this, I question your salvation. See, let me prove it. I could have been a lawyer. <laughs> Exhibit 45. <laughs> In a post-cross, post-Levitical priesthood where there is no temple, we are now under the order of Melchizedek priesthood of Yeshua. I see all that is basically left for us to do concerning obeying the commandments as an act of love and fruit, not root of our salvation. So that, you see, luring the Christians in, he's talking about as an act of love, not a, not a root or fruit, not, not anything has to do with salvation. But notice he left out the zitzitz. So obviously he came to this revelation later, so he added that one in. The Ten Commandments, including the Fourth, the Sabbath, the appointed feast, except for except for animal sacrifices. Well, why not? Why we? Why did that end? Oh, maybe it was fulfilled in Jesus, right? The dietary laws for our own good health. I told him on the phone. This was hilarious. I said, you know, my great aunts, they love God. They got saved in the 1930s in a brush arbor meeting from people that came from Azusa Street. Two of them, of the three, baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have been speaking of the tongues. Two of, of the three didn't marry, lived a holy life, went to church their whole life, loved God, were intercessors. I caught them often on their knees in prayer with tears running down their face. Godly women who prayed me into salvation. I said, they ate pork morning, noon, and night, even in their vegetables. <laughs> You should have heard the crickets on the other end of the phone for a minute. And I said, and they lived to be 89, 82, and one still alive at 97. I think their health's fine. You know why? Because they always prayed over their food and thank God for their food. They grew up in the depression when they were happy to get a possum to eat. I said, you want to you want to talk about I, I had a friend of mine was a missionary in the Philippines and there was a Philippine uh, village that basically their houses lived on stilts over the water. And the only food they could get every day was shrimp. You're going to go tell them they got to keep the law. Yeah, that's the message you want to take to those people as a missionary. They need to keep the law. So you got to stop eating shrimp. Otherwise they all starve to death. I mean, I've been in the African bush where there's nothing. They'd be happy to get them a pig to eat. Thrilled. This is ridiculous, people. I believe God. I believe God released us to even from that dietary life. Because he knew the the world where the world population was going to go, and people were going to just have to survive. Every creature is good to be received. That's what he said. And he says it in Genesis 2. But look at this. Listen right here. So he says it's not a salvation issue, right? In one post, fork, tongue, individual. But then right here, he said, who said anything about keeping the law uh, or keeping the law to keep salvation? I see it as a fruits of salvation, not the root of it. However, John did clearly state that those who are against obeying Yahweh are in fact liars and the truth is not in them. So I'd question their salvation to begin with in such a scenario. Boom, there you have it. According to Psalm 119 and 1 John 2 through 5, how do we know we're saved? Well, I would say check your heart. Does Yahweh's law bring great joy and a sincere desire to follow it out of love for our Creator and fellow man? Or are you constantly repulsed by the very mention of obedience to Yahweh's law and want nothing to do with it? Sadly, I've seen a ton, a ton of people, including a shocking number of pastors, and he's referring to me, by the way, in the latter category who claim to be Christians. That's kind of frightening, claim to be Christians. So he's saying you can't be a Christian. You're just claiming to be a Christian if you're not trying to keep these Old Testament laws. So out of one mouth, he says it's not a salvation issue. The next, he says, well, I question your salvation. Well, how is that possible? Can't do both. See, Rob's exposed. It is to him a salvation issue. But he knows if he just came out and said it plainly, 
that all the Christians that are support his ministry would bolt and he'd be left with the wacky dudes. Now, here's where he got on me and, and Nathan Roberts right here. These were recent right here. Read Matthew 5. Are you going to be least in the kingdom or great? I say aim high. Let the antinomian and Nicolaitans aim for the sewers if that's what they want to do. As they likewise risk the fate of the lawless, which is the spirit of Antichrist that Yeshua speaks of in Matthew 7. Ultimately, their fight is not with me. It's not about me and Nathan Roberts. Born again Christians. Their fight is not with me. They are at war with Yahweh. Because as I read the whole council of scripture, somehow I can't help but believe in claiming, but Paul Galatians will be much help to you on that day. And he goes on to make it a salvation. Please note also that you see many will be crying, but Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy and cast out demons? And he said, prophecy. Didn't we prophesy, cast out demons and do many want to depart from me? <laughs> So he, he is making this a salvation issue. Look over here. By interpreting this as the Old Testament commandments that the New Testament tells us we are not under and not keeping it in a New Testament context, he says, so when you see someone wroth with believers in Christ going to war against him who keep the commandments of God, it would seem quite clear whose side they are. So they're saying, if you're against, Rob's saying, if you're against me and keeping the Sabbath, and the feast, and the tzitzits, then you're on the side of the Antichrist. Side of the devil. I mean, does everybody see this, or is it just Pastor Dan? This is why I said the other day, once he came out and started his open attack on me and Nathan, I said the gloves are off. That's why, you, that's why we're dealing with this today. I've held this, some of this stuff back for over a year. I was hoping he would repent and come out of his false gospel, perverted gospel, and his law for salvation. But he won't. No, he, he's so triggered, he's making about 20 posts a day. <laughs> but see, let me tell you, he's just one of these leaders. There is an absolute obsession with this. That's why on the first slide, I had, what, six different ones? That's just, that's just a handful. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And they claim it's this, this Ephraim awakening. No, it's Ephraim apostasy. And it's, and it's just completely separating and dividing New Testament, New Covenant believers. <coughs> Look, do you follow Yeshua or Paul? Are you a born-again Bible-believing Christian or a deluded Paulian? Oh, I could keep rocking this out. I had so many I had to just pick and choose from. Down here he says, I can't help you answer that. If you're just going to quote Galatians all day in total ignorance, falling into the category Peter warned about in 2 Peter 3, as your rebuttal to any hint of suggesting that it's a good idea, to, a good idea to obey Yahweh, then you might as well just start calling yourself a deluded Paulian instead of a born again Bible believing Christian. See, he always sets Paul apart. He's an Ebionite. He just tries to hide it because it's not good for offerings. <laughs> King of the strong man. I said this earlier. I got ahead of myself. But a strong man argument is you misrepresent someone's argument to make it easier to attack. This is what he says all the time. Well, I'm just saying you should love you should love God and keep his commandments. That's all I'm saying. You bunch of heathens, you don't do it. But he doesn't put that in context. Nobody's saying you shouldn't live a moral life in the new covenant. But you say they're saying that so that you can guard your position. It's very dishonest, actually. Because he's smart enough to know what he's doing. 
That was easy to do right there. Let me, let me show you something. Here's some of the straw man argument. Somehow, I don't think the I don't have to obey Yahweh because Jesus already did routine is going to fly when you meet him. See where he takes it? Salvation issue. Pastor, he stuck me. Repent of sin. Me, sin is transgression of the law. Pastor, repent for saying that you Judaizing heretic. No, I rebuke him for taking it out of New Testament context and putting it into an old. But he doesn't say that. Again, straw man. Here's another one. The beast is called lawless. The lawless one, man of sin. Why is it such a big deal if the law has allegedly been done away with? See, that's, that's a straw man. Because nobody's saying there's not New Testament law, that there's not the law of Christ, that there's not morality in the new covenant that you should keep and obey. But he's taking that out of its context and saying, no, we got to go back and keep all these Old Testament laws. So see what he does. Again, he misrepresents our position to make our position easier to attack. So he keeps his little groupies happy on Facebook. Oh, Rob, we love you. And this, this, this is, this is, you know, this is good 101. This is how it works. Listen, false teachers, when they get into false, whether they're doing it on purpose or they're just deceived themselves, when they get into this stuff, when they, they always are going to have some truth or they wouldn't be able to deceive any Christian. There's always going to be some truth. I'm not saying everything he says is not true or any of these Torah teachers and leaders. Some of it's true, but it's context. You take something out of its context, it makes it can make it untrue. It can make it false. It can make it deceptive. So, and that's what I was talking about. This is what he pulls out all the time. This is 2 John, I mean, 1 John chapter 2. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is his go-to passage all the time. If you don't keep the Old Testament commandments, but see what he does is he takes this New Testament verse out of a New Testament context and puts it in the old and says, we got to keep the old. That is his deception. Whether he's doing it on purpose or he's deceived, that's the deception within the Torah movement. They all go to this, Doug Hamp, all of them, they go to this right here and take that word commandments and try to apply it to the Old Testament. You hear me? Can't do that. One of the first lessons of rightly dividing the scripture, was this, remember 1 Timothy 2? Rightly dividing the Word of God, old and new, knowing the difference, and keeping things in context. But let's keep going here. He says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law and the prophets. This is their go to verse. But to, Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's keep reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this real quick. He says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So this is the verse they always go to. Uh, of course, the word destroy here. I, I love this. This is the Blue Letter Bible. One of the things says, deprive of success. Well, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy or deprive the law of its success. Why? Because Why? he succeeded. So he didn't come to destroy. He came to make the law a success in the life of a human who happened to also be God. Now let's look at this right here. The word fulfill, when Jesus said that he came to fulfill, means to make full, to fill up, to fill to the full, to cause to abound, to furnish, to supply liberally, to render full, to complete, to fill to the top so that nothing shall be wanting to full measure, to fill to the brim. So when Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law, he talking about it's like filling up a cup, like filling up a glass. Look here. He goes on to say, all right? The strong says to make replete, to level up a hollow. You fill it in, fill it in, fill, fulfill, right? So this is what I'm showing you here. Here's the law. For the law made nothing perfect, but bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh to God. Hebrews 7, 19. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then there should no place have been sought for the second. Hebrews 8, 7. So there's the law. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So what did Jesus do? He didn't destroy the law. 
How could, if he destroyed the glass, how could he fill it? He didn't destroy it. He didn't come to destroy. He came to fill it up. So what Jesus did was he filled it up. Now, once he filled it up, there's no more room for you and I to try and go and fill it up. He fulfilled it. He didn't destroy it. He fulfilled it. Now remember, they always harp on, well, not one jot or ten will pass from the law. It will all be, right? Now, either that is at the end when Jesus comes, or that's when Jesus said something on the cross. Like, it is finished. Let me, let me make my case here. Here we go. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth the end. He's the end. That's it. We, go, we, don't, we, we don't go any further than Him. But let's keep going here. Now let's look at heaven. And I'm, I'm going to skip through this because this deals with the, the language. Did Jesus fulfill His mission on the cross? I believe so. But let's look at it. When Jesus had received the drink, He said, hanging on the cross, it is finished. And with that, He bowed His head and gave up the ghost, as it says in the King James, or His Spirit, John 19.30. Now, there it is again. It is finished. What is finished? Let's look at this. Matthew 27, 50 through 51. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, and Matthew doesn't say he said it is finished, but it's, it was right before he died what he cried out. So you put John and Luke, Matthew together. But Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, it is finished, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now, folks, the veil in the temple, that veil right there, between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place, the veil of the tabernacle and later the two temples was more than a jot or tittle of the law. The veil was mentioned 26 times in Le Exodus and Leviticus alone. It is also mentioned in 2 Chronicles. It was a very important part of fulfilling the commands of the law. That veil had to be there. So the moment Jesus dies on the cross, the moment He pays the full price of the law, the penalty, the demands of the law against sin, God Himself ripped the veil of the temple and so part of the law passed away right there. Gone. God Himself was saying, it's fulfilled this system is over. I want to point this verse out. This is Hebrews 8. He said, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. That's from Jeremiah, talking about the new covenant. And then he saith this right here, In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews was written right before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's he's prophesying. I believe the writer of this was either Paul or Barnabas, one of the two. But he's flat saying here that that which is waxing old, the old covenant, the rest of it, God ripped the veil. He started the process of the jot and tittle passing away. But in 70 AD, it was all wiped out. That which is old is about to. Not yet. It's not fully done yet because that building's still standing. But remember, Jesus talked about not one stone will be left upon another. I think that's more than a jot or a tittle. The veil, the temple, the priesthood. So Jesus saying, I came to fulfill the law. When did that happen? When he said on the cross, it is finished. Period. Anybody that says different is a deceiver and a liar. Look at that one. Just a few in Hebrews 8. For the priesthood being changed, there was made a necessity, a change also of the law. They'll say, Torah, peace, law didn't change. There it is. Change of the law. Let's keep going. For well, there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, the weakness and unprofitableness thereof, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh to God. We could just go on down the list. Now, 
He's talking about, he goes on to Hebrews 10, talking about the blood of Jesus. How precious is the blood of Jesus? We're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. The focus is in the New Testament is the blood of Jesus for righteousness, not the law. All right? Now, this guy. This is the one that Rob defended. This is the guy he gets a lot of his stuff from, too. This is one of his teachers. His name's Jim State. Of course, he's in prison. Frank Charles Pastor gets seven years in prison for defrauding investors in a business he had of $3.3 million, pleaded guilty. Okay? Got seven years to serve. This is one of his teachers, and he still defends this guy. Right? So here, here's the email where Rob defended him. D. Odell, I'm not getting off base with serious matters of defining the gospel and salvation and the triune nature of God. Uh, yes, you are. We've demonstrated that today with Exhibit 4500. He said, I've said no, uh, nothing I've said contradicts anything but the doctrines of men, including Mithra worshipers. Now, that, that, most people wouldn't catch that. Because, of course, Constantine is said to have been a Mithra worship. So what he was saying is, I haven't contradicted anything that basically Constantine didn't twist or put it. So he's showing his beliefs back to Pappy, right? And the whole Constantine added the Trinity doctrine. Baloney, right? By the way, that was a low blow against Jim Staley. You don't know the whole story, so it would be wise not to assume you do. Well, I know he went to prison for stealing money and he pleaded guilty and did the full perp walk in the orange jumpsuit, right? Now, that's not what troubles me the most about this guy. Anybody could fall, anybody could sin, right? What bothers me about this guy is his whole message is we need to go back and keep the law to be really right with God. I listened to this entire message of his yesterday, The Great Deception, part one. And he's talking about being deceived and he's actually talking about spiritual warfare. But then he gets into what, what the answer is to spiritual warfare is to make sure you are keeping the commandments of Yahweh. You're keeping the old covenant laws. So, because this is his whole message. It permeates everything he does. And then he gets off into talking about frequencies. But let me just go ahead and say, and I'm going to say it boldly, and I don't care. I've looked into this guy. I think he's a Kabbalist. He quotes directly from Jewish mysticism from the Kabbalah. I think he's a deceiver. Whether he knows it or not, he claims an angel appeared to him and Jesus appeared to him. And all of a sudden he understands the book of Romans now like nobody else. And he started this ministry in 2009. And when I was talking to Rob on the phone, he talked about, no, this, because I, I said something about my, well, it was when I was talking about my great aunts, you know, and my great grandmother. Well, well, the awakening really began in 2009. And then I find out this guy, his mentor, his hero, I guess, started this ministry in 2000. It's funny because I think Rob's even trying to look like him a little bit. It's really bizarre. But this is what caught my attention. Remember, the whole thing is talking about spiritual warfare, not being deceived. The answer to that is keep the commandments of Yahweh. But then he makes this statement about being really clean before God. Listen to this. Some of you want more knowledge. You want me to teach more on the, uh, in the deep of uh, the Hebrew. This is as deep as it gets. This is your soul. This is everything inside of you. This is your DNA. This is who you are. You want to touch the face of God? According to the Torah, you have to be clean. And we're not talking physical. It's spiritual. And if we've been deceived to thinking, oh, I can just waltz right into the throne of grace because I have the blood of Yeshua on my heart. Try that one. Let's see how it works for you. No, the blood of Jesus is not enough to walk into the throne of grace. You know, that's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. It's exactly the opposite. It says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace by the blood of the Lamb. We can enter into the holiest of all, not because we wear zitzits and keep the Sabbath and don't eat pork. It's because of the blood of Jesus. That is a devil, demon, mocking spirit that hates the blood of Jesus, hates the new covenant. And that's why I hate it with a holy passion. I hate every false way. Here, there's something from the law for you. I hate every false way. 
It's false. Pappy, Staley, Hamp, 119 Ministries. It is all heresy to believe you can, you got to add the law that the blood of Jesus and faith in his blood and being born again by faith, that that's not enough. That you got to go add to these, these works of the law. This is blasphemy of the blood of Jesus Christ. You heard it. And you can see the demon come up in his face. See how that works for you. It's going to work fine for me, Jack. I wish they'd have given him about 50 years so he won't get out teaching this mess. Remember a minute ago, we read in Galatians, it said his judgment's coming. It teaches this stuff. His came, didn't it? Maybe God will get his attention. I hope so. See, Pastor Dean's fired up because I'm fired up about the little ones, the young ones, the babes in Christ. The people being deceived by this. But it's more than that. It is a subtle attack. It, that is really the spirit of Antichrist. Right? The spirit of Antichrist hates Jesus. And the blood of Jesus. So, as they say, Today, tee it high. We just tee it high and let it fly, right? Let the chips fall where they may. Get ready. There will be just a flood of the law dogs. Oh, they're going to be losing their minds. They already are. <laughs> Woo! Because you know what? It just reveals it's true. It's true because you know what he say? What did he say about the bond woman and the free woman in Galatians 4? The one that's after the flesh trying to keep the law and be under the law always persecutes the one that's free in the new covenant. They want the Sinai covenant? Fine, y'all go have it. I'm taking the new covenant. Not the so-called new covenant as Rob says but the real new covenant. The one that's written in this book from the apostles. Amen. You can be an EB a night if you want to. Hey, it's free world. But you've been told, you've been warned. Keep pushing that stuff to, to the lambs and the sheep and you're going to be judged for it. Let's stand. Let's do... Let's do our theme song here lately. Crowder again. Yep. Now see, this is the anthem here of the New Covenant. This is it right here. All my hope is in Jesus. My hope is in, not in me. Thank God. Because me can't do it. Me can't make it. And on the day I stand before Him, let me tell you, on the day you stand before God, you better not plead anything but, Lord, listen, I do this now with Him. When I get down to pray, some of the first things I always say is, Lord, I don't deserve one thing from You. I haven't earned it. I'm not righteous enough, good enough, holy enough, diligent enough. I didn't, I can't earn anything from you. And my only righteousness standing before you is the blood of Jesus. I don't claim any on my own. Only a fool will claim he's mustered some kind of righteousness up by putting tassels on his belt. Lord have mercy. The blood. Quit, it get, don't let this stuff get your eyes off of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on that cross. It is precious, priceless, holy. 
It is our righteousness. It is our healing. It is our deliverance. It is our salvation. It is everything. See how that works for you. Devil. Let's do Let's worship through our song and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Lord, we pray for those that have been watching and listening, those who will watch and listen. Lord, that they grasp the truth of the new covenant, the new testament. That it's by faith in you, in your blood that was shed, in your righteousness. It's not a license to live immoral. But God, make it clear that we're not under the old covenant law anymore. We thank you, God, for the truth. It's plainly written in the New Testament. We thank you, Lord, you foretold the new covenant in the old. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies all pointing to Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. All our hope. So we thank you for the new covenant, the new testament in your blood. And that we thank you for true salvation that comes by faith in that. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen.